Welcome to day 164 of reading through the Bible this year. Today we read 1 Kings 8 and 2 Chronicles 5, more parallel accounts telling us some different perspectives and varying details of bringing the ark into the temple and dedicating it, representing bringing the presence of the Lord into the temple. Now that everything's done, the final thing is to bring the object that represents the actual presence of the Lord into this place that it is, that is his house on this earth. A couple of interesting points as we go through chapter eight of first Kings here, Solomon brings the ark you know, he gathers all the men of Israel, offers a ton of sacrifices, tries to make it a big holy thing. They go to the tent that David had sent up, a, a tabernacle to sit in Jerusalem and hold the Ark of the Covenant until the time when they could bring it into the temple once it was complete. Now that it's complete, they move it and they place it. If you remember during the construction of the temple, we read about how there were these two massive cherubim, these two giant warrior angels. Cherubim are not soft, fluffy baby, you know, chubby baby angels angels with tiny wings and diapers and little bows. They're giant warriors with huge wings. They have these two huge carved cherubim with their wings spreading across the whole of the inner sanctuary. These kind of mimic the two angels that sit on top of the Ark of the Covenant with their wings leaning forward, almost touching over the top, making the mercy seat the place where the presence of God is supposed to dwell when the high priest comes in to meet with him or when Moses would come in and meet with him. That's where uh, his presence would show up is right between the wings and the top of the Ark there. And so it's kind of like this double covering of like this place that the angels have covered, sort of signifying that this whole space now is going to be where the Lord's presence dwells with his people. Then the cloud fills the temple in or fills the inner sanctuary in verse 10 so that they had to stop ministering and they all had to leave. And that happened in Exodus when the glory of the Lord would fill the tent of meeting and Moses couldn't go in. And, and that goes all the way back to, you know, the pillar of cloud and fire that God's presence is represented so many times by this cloud of glory that nobody can quite approach or enter into. And even when Moses is up on top of the mountain receiving uh, the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law, the, this cloud descends and there's this crazy storm represented by this cloud of the Lord's glory up there. And this is kind of signifying that the glory of the Lord has truly entered into and is now dwelling in and blessing and accepting this new place of dwelling and meeting with humans. Verses 12 through 21 of chapter 8 here have Solomon's blessing of the Lord. He first directs it directly to the Lord saying, the Lord said that he would dwell in total darkness. I have indeed built an exalted temple for you, a place for your dwelling forever. And then he turns around and he gives this blessing, still blessing God, but he, he delivers it to the congregation gathered there, all the leaders of Israel and a bunch of other people there. And then in verse 22, it moves into this entire blessing prayer that sort of echoes some of the requirement and agreement between God and Israel and its leadership ongoing from Deuteronomy and sort of this blessing and warning that if you you know, follow the ways of of Yahweh, then things will go well. And if you don't, it's going to really bring about curse and destruction on you as a people and as a nation. When Solomon finishes praying, he then offers up this blessing and um, kind of call to Israel to follow Yahweh well. He says, in verse 59, may my words with which I've made my petition before the Lord be near the Lord our God day and night. May he hold uphold his servant's cause and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires. And may all the peoples of the earth know that the Lord is God. There is no other. So be def wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commands as it is today. And so then they initiate a 14 day festival there before the Lord and they consecrate the ground, the ground outside the sanctuary because, um, uh, the, 
altar inside the sanctuary cannot possibly contain all the sacrifices they offer. And they have this massive festival for two weeks. And on the 15th day, Solomon turns to the people and dismisses them and sends them away. Second Chronicles 5 is going to have a lot of the same overall account for us, but it's going to be split up more. And so the entire account that we just read in first Kings eight is going to be split up through five is just going to take us from dedicating the, you know, the beginning of calling together the assembly to bring the ark in. And then uh, the celebration, it, it kind of focuses on some of the worship going on a little differently than, uh, the way it's described in first Kings. And then it says that the trumpeters and singers join together and to praise and thank the Lord with one voice they raise their voices accompanied by trumpet cymbals and musical instruments in praise to the lord for he is good his faithful love endures forever and the temple the lord's temple was filled with a cloud and because of the cloud the priests were not able to continue ministering for the glory of the lord filled god's temple and then it splits chapters here and chapter six and seven are going to continue with uh, some of the same details that we got in all of all contained in chapter eight first king so just a slightly different chapter and verse uh, differentiation, but also the focuses are just a little bit different. And so as you read through, I'd love to hear, you know, what details stand out to you, uh, what speaks differently, how do you read these different accounts, if that seemed significant um, to you. As for me, as I read through this, in First Kings chapter 8, Solomon's blessing at the end of the chapter really speaks to me because I think while there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament, a lot of promises and things and, and parts of the covenant with Israel that we have to be careful about how we connect those to ourselves. And we want to be careful not to read ourselves in and say, well, every promise to Israel now gets to be fulfilled in my life personally. A lot of these weren't personal guarantees or blessings or promises to each individual as much as they were an overall promise to the people of God. And that can be fulfilled without ever personally blessing you or including you in that. Um, but even more, some of these were contingent upon Israel in the land at that time or in a nearer future time. And so the character of God in his faithfulness, as is praised here, is consistent and something we can learn from and hang on to. But the particulars of specific promises, we have to be careful and make sure that those are universal promises for all time and not contingent covenantal promises that are for Israel in the time that they're being given. So with that said, some of what Solomon says here, as he says, blessed be the Lord, he has given rest to his people, Israel, according to all he has said. Not one of all the good promises he made through his servant Moses has failed. And that's the thing is when we go back and look at the promises that God made to Moses about bringing the people into the promised land, about uh, the promises he made to Abraham about establishing the people in the promised land, there are certain aspects of that that speak to the future when all all people uh, who place faith in Christ will be redeemed and established in a land with the Lord in his eternal kingdom. That, the, Those hints that point beyond that apply to all of us, but we should not take those things and consider modern Israel or some other place in this world, including America, as some sort of current promised land that should somehow receive all of these specific blessings above and beyond any other nation in this world. That's not how any of this is meant to be read. At the same time, we see God's character. He is absolutely faithful and he never fails to fulfill his promises. And every time we see Israel or any prophets or anyone acknowledging all the promises of God that have been fulfilled, we can rejoice and take heart and know that all of the promises, especially as we get into the New Testament and we see the promises that Jesus left us, that when he says things like, know that I am with you always, even to the end of the age, that is something that we can take and, and apply to ourselves as well and know that Christ is with us, know that the Holy Spirit is with us, know that we are blessed and in the presence of the Lord in a unique way where we don't have to show up to the temple where the presence of God in a cloud form has filled the place. We have the presence of God in us dwelling as the Holy Spirit. And so in that, 
as we look through these promises, there's also this challenge and this conviction of if we want to be the people of God, if we want to continue in that way, then we also need to be people who do look to the Lord and um, that we would be wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commands. That is something that we, that should not, it doesn't save us. It doesn't secure our salvation, but it displays the salvation work in us that we walk according to his ways. And so that's something that we can look at and lean into and know that this eternal promise is sure. Therefore, let us walk righteously as if we are those people who belong in that country of eternity with God, in that kingdom that lasts forever with Yahweh as its ruler. That's what stands out to me. That's what's speaking to me today. What are you getting out of God's word today? Let's talk about it in the chat. Keep reading. Thank you for joining us today. Be rad for Jesus.